Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here for some APUSH exam day review. Sorry for the late start, we had some technical difficulties. Thank you all for bearing with me on that. Okay, sometimes when you're streaming on these things, it used to be a little simpler. You used to be able to stream straight from YouTube and now you've got to use something outside of YouTube. So we're, we're doing what we can here. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And I want to first make you aware of some resources that we've got in the video description. If you're watching on YouTube, we've got some resources in the video description that I want to make sure that everybody's aware of. Okay, so let's just kind of go through here one by one so that we can see what uh, what is going on. Now, okay, so going into this, we are now sharing our screen. So first of all, let's uh, just go ahead and note that uh, you can go to my APUSH DBQ page which is the first thing that's linked. You can go there and there's all kinds of stuff here. We've got a rubric available for the DBQ. All right, it's not, okay, there we go. We've got a DBQ rubric available if you wanna have that on hand while you're writing. Even better would be the annotation guide from my friends at Marco Learning that even prioritizes the points, okay? So it prioritizes all the points here. And so with that, you can see that we've got an annotation guide. I wouldn't encourage you to print your documents because that's gonna take time. And we've got a pre-writing worksheet. That's all available on this page, okay? Now then also, if you need a little refresher, I've got a video on the APUSH DBQ, and then I've got a couple of DBQs. If you're wanting to look over a DBQ, if you weren't here with us before and you're here for the first time, we've got a DBQ on the effects of democracy. And then right under that, I've got a sample essay. I've got setup notes and a sample essay. So you can go ahead and take a look at those notes. You can take a look at the sample essay and you'll be able to see what's there, okay? And then of course, reconstruction. I've got a DBQ on reconstruction and that is that is there well as well. You can view the sample essay. Now also note here, the banner will take you to free study guides at Marco Learning. Marco Learning has a free study guide for every single uh, unit, okay? So we've got units three through seven. You can download a study guide pack, okay? So you can download a study guide pack. Just click on here. Let's see, click on US history. And you can download a free study guide, guide pack that's got units one through seven and beautiful study guides here, depending on what the DBQ is on. If you're thinking like, hey, you know, I might want that for my open notes or something like that. This gives us some things like some key terms here. OK, so you think about this, that if it's on, uh, you know, if we're thinking about unit six, uh, then what you're doing here is you see the second industrial revolution, the so-called robber barons or captains of industry. So this is focused on the gilded age all right and so you see here uh with the you know a map of the trail of tears okay so we see here mark twain called the period the gilded age why did he do that so you are welcome to go and click on that link um, so that you can download Marco Learning's free study guides that you can have on hand. Uh, beautiful study guides absolutely free and from my friends at Marco Learning. And so from there, so you can go there from the APUSH DBQ page. Also, I've got, you can go to crowdcast.io slash Tom Ritchie. If you want a front seat, if you're really wanting to ask your question, if you're wanting to upvote questions, participate in polls, front row seat, this is a public broadcast available to everyone, but you can see how fast the chat moves here. So we want to make sure that for those of you who have some questions, you want to interact with me directly, front row seats are just $5 uh, and you can get a front row seat and be in the crowdcast chat. But this is a free public broadcast. OK, so with that, um, so we see Romulus A Push review and we can see this at the App Store and Google Play. This is my app, just a little trivia app, very simple. And right now, number four in education. Wonder if we can get that to number one in education at the App Store. Just a little trivia app. It's just a little thing you can go through and you can pick, uh, you know, which topic that you want to go over and it'll ask you some little trivia questions. Just a simple little $1.99 app. If you find it useful, give it a good review. And so that's Romulus, your uh, Romulus A Push review, rather, at the App Store. We have a Euro app and a World History app and Governor app as well, uh, government app as well. Now, on my Instagram account, I will be giving occasional shout outs for people who follow my Instagram account. 
we've got uh, a timing guide for the AP US history exam. Remember, you're gonna wanna log in 30 minutes in advance. So 1.30 p.m. Eastern, you are gonna wanna make sure that you are logged in um, on the College Board website. Now, then 45 minutes for the DBQ. Five minutes to upload. Ladies and gentlemen, spend these five minutes uploading. Don't waste your time, okay? Because there are people who have run out of time because they did not use their time wisely. At 45 minutes, you need to finish your sentence, paste it into the College Board interface, and I would not, under any circumstances, still be working at minute 48. And remember, uh, a few recommendations that I have. Make sure that you are typing your essay on something that's native to your computer, okay? So I would recommend Microsoft Word, Notes, something like that, rather than Google Drive, which is dependent on the internet. Uh, I had a tutoring client whose internet went out during the exam. Some people who are not submitting their exams, it's problems on their end. It's not always the College Board's fault. And of course, we've got a little uh, point of view analysis there uh, where, you know, Tom Ritchie, not always the biggest fan of the College Board, is saying it's not always the College Board's fault. So that uh, must be must be right because Tom Ritchie seldom uh, misses an opportunity uh, to criticize the College Board. So there's some point of view analysis when we're thinking about our point of view, hip analysis. So remember there are some videos on my channel, my POV hold it down video um, and my POV uh, hold it down handout. So you can go to Google POV hold it down and you can see my, my handout here. You can also see my new video on point of view and hip analysis, okay? So if you're looking for that, that's something comes from a viral video back in 2014. So that's the timing guide. Make sure to take that seriously. Once that red light starts blinking, please don't keep working. Please start turning your stuff in so that you don't have to take the exam in June. That's some friendly advice from my friends at Marco Learning who are also on Instagram. So make sure, you know, Marco Learning's got so much, uh, so much great stuff on Instagram. Uh, what, you know, between good advice, you know, timing guides, but then, you know, and then we've got AP exams Q&A from John, the founder of Marco Learning. Marco is a comfort animal, okay? It be the cutest dog and also some great little, uh, great little videos here um, that are, um, that are that are excellent. Okay, so as far as that uh, as far as that goes, uh, you know, this is how to do a super short um, AP exam. Okay, so just how to do one of these super short AP exams. So with that, and uh, thank you for those of you who are liking recent posts and following and all of that, uh, all of that good stuff. But I'm very thankful for my friend to my friends at Marco Learning for providing a lot of great resources for AP students. And Marco's got some great stuff for AP government as well. A lot of y'all are going to be taking AP government or AP literature, Marco Learnings and several subjects. So that's something that is, you know, a very useful account for you to follow. Now, another thing is our exam day gag, okay? So we've got our exam day gag. Some people ask for an exam day gag. And so what we've got here is how to write Supreme Leader on your APUSH 2020 DBQ. So, you know, something like this, after the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, Supreme Leader of Freeing Slaves, offered a generous policy of presidential reconstruction to the former Confederate states that required only emancipation and a loyalty oath by 10% of voters. This was known as Lincoln's 10% plan. See, we're doing some review here while we get ready for our exam day gag. Be sure to share this with your friends. And in 1848, so we see Catherine is sharing this with her friends. Excellent, Catherine, that's awesome. And so in 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Supreme Leader of Women's Suffrage, organized the Seneca Falls Convention, which produced a declaration of sentiments in favor of women's rights. Frederick Douglass, a former slave and supreme leader of abolitionism, was also present at Seneca Falls. There was an overachiever there, just putting a few of those in there. At the height of the lynching crisis, Ida B. Wells, supreme leader of muckraking, wrote several articles do documenting lynchings in the South and calling for reform. During the debate on the Compromise of 1850, John C. Calhoun, Supreme Leader of Nullification, opposed the South agreeing to any further compromises with the North. Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton, Hamilton. I uh, hear that's gonna be streaming on Disney Plus pretty soon, right? Secretary of the Treasury and Supreme Leader of the Federalist Party, 
favored the creation of a national bank and wanted the government to promote domestic manufacturing. All right, uh, nice try 2004. Some of y'all get me to read stuff and I usually catch it beforehand. Uh, Milky Way lover, um, 365. And by the way, there's really nothing especially funny about racism. Uh, so M underscore Solovy, thank you. Colette Clooney, uh, Ritz Wong has followed me on Instagram. Eddie Berger, Eddie Berger, I think you followed before. I think you're just trying to get as many shout outs as possible. Dalton Wood won, um, Donog win. Let's see, Juliana, Rosi, Eric M5, Shivam B123. Uh, Will Pattinson, Sophia Mara, 04. Thank you for the follow. And Ashley Nicole, 2828. Okay, so we've got, uh, you know, a lot of great people following now. Um, thank y'all. And uh, shout out to people at t -Ville High School. Shout out to t -Ville High School. Um, HCAT underscore Leo Sander, BT Free 101, Colonel Hanson, 06. Sapphic Sung. Um, Nay, Yay, Diago, and Jenna all. Okay, thank y'all so much. And I'll also be doing some occasional shout outs to people who are following Marco Learning. So with that, uh, let's uh, let's go ahead here and see what else we've got. Free review guides available. Now here is the, uh, actually I've got that twice. Okay, I've got that twice. But anyway, those are all there, ladies and gentlemen, and we will go ahead and get ourselves into the review proper. I just want you to know about all of the resources that are there for you that we're able to uh, that we're able to help you with. OK, so with that, uh, let's see. So free study guides for Marco Learning. Let me just make sure that that's not on there twice. All right. So with that, if you all like that Supreme Leader gag, be sure to share that with your friends. I've also done that on Twitter. I will be taking a few questions from Twitter followers today as well. Okay, so with that, um, <laughs> Supreme Leader Tom, what were some of the key causes and effects of Manifest Destiny? Dean, um, from the Fireside Chats, okay, yeah, which I've got, still got. The Supreme Leader haircut's not going to go away. I'm hopefully, I think the barber shops are opening next week in South Carolina. Um, so with that, what were some of the key causes and manif effects of Manifest Destiny? So as far as causes, what we want to understand here is this gets into, now this concept is controversial with some people, but this idea of American exceptionalism, okay? American exceptionalism is this idea that basically the United States is a special and chosen country, okay? The United States is a special and chosen country, and God has, a, like when God put out the plan for the universe, um, he was thinking in terms of the United States is going to play a role in enlightening the world. And so you see when Thomas Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence, he writes the words divine providence, like the United States is protected by divine providence. Jefferson, a deist, uh, believed that the United States really was part of God's master plan to lead the world to enlightenment, to make the world more free. And so Jefferson also, when you think about this, he is the person who, uh, you the president who executed the Louisiana Purchase, which, uh, you know, was a very large purchase of land and guaranteed that the United States would continue to exist for some decades as an agrarian republic. Remember that Thomas Jefferson was, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson was a big proponent of agriculture. He believed that in order to have a Republican form of government, that we're going to need to be agricultural, that if we have cities, if we urbanize like Europe, we will be corrupt like Europe. Jefferson did not want any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of manufacturing in the United States. Thomas Jefferson, supreme leader of agrarianism, whereas Alexander Hamilton wanted to promote manufacturing. Now, in the next generation, remember Henry Clay takes up Hamilton's uh, Hamilton's call for, uh, you know, promoting manufacturing with his American system. NIP, National Bank, Internal Improvements, Protective Tariff. NIP. And so make sure that you understand Henry Clay's American system. All right. So that's something in the antebellum period that he is trying to promote a self-sufficient national economy after the war of 1812. And so this is very controversial in the antebellum period leading to the nullification crisis. But back to manifest destiny. Manifest, if something is manifest, it is obvious Destiny means that we are somehow meant for it. OK, so when we think about this, uh, you know, manifest destiny, we are meant for it. And so with this, that God has this plan 
that he has set aside the United States um, to be a chosen country. OK, so as far as that uh, we've got here. All right. So we've got a chosen country. And that's what Jefferson said in his, uh, you know, in his um, second inaugural address, I believe. Um, that he talks about, you know, we need to thank this God in whose hands we are, who has given us a chosen country. And he described the United States. And this is Jefferson talking in his inaugural address, public statements, where he says that like Israel of old, God has brought us to this promised land uh, with the, all of the necessaries of life and room for the thousandth and thousandth generation. And so Jefferson truly believed that the United States is this special, exceptional and chosen country. And because of that, you know, the next generation develops this idea of manifest destiny that, you know, we are destined to basically cover the, as much of the North American continent as we can. OK, so as much as possible. So with that, what we're uh, what we're seeing there is the foundation of manifest destiny now. This is, of course, uh, we see that manifest destiny culminates in the annexation of Texas. This is something that the political class was a little bit iffy on. OK, the political class was a little bit iffy on annexing Texas in the 1830s. Texas became independent in 1836 and then Texas petitioned to come into the union. They wanted to come into the union. And the United States, Jackson, Andrew Jackson, was a personal friend of Sam Houston, the president of the Republic of Texas. But Jackson felt like, you know what, this is going to be something that does not, uh, you know, that does that creates discord in the United States. Two reasons not to annex Texas, that it's going to create debates about slavery in the United States with Texas coming in as this large slave state that could conceivably be divided into smaller slave states. So that's something that that Jackson, you know, is thinking we don't want to start a debate over slavery. This is the time when Congress had the gag rule. OK, so you saw the gag rule in Congress and they didn't accept any anti-slave. Well, they accepted anti-slavery petitions, but they did not. Uh, they did not discuss them. OK, um, thank you, uh, Rose uh, Segadelli, for the recent follow on Instagram. And thank you for all of you who are, who are uh, sharing our Supreme Leader gag. OK, so with this, uh, you know, we're going now with the development of democracy. And so we want to understand that in the aristocratic republic um, of the that the framers of the Constitution put together, that you don't necessarily have to listen to the people if the people are going to lead you in a bad direction, that the framers wanted a government that had elements of democracy, but wasn't necessarily a democracy. This was a time, remember, that at the time of the American founding, voting was typically tied to property ownership. And so when you see the development of Jacksonian democracy with states, uh, you know, adopting new constitutions in the West and amending their constitutions in the East uh, that are saying that voting is just based on, uh, you know, universal white male suffrage, regardless of property ownership. And so we start to see that popular campaigning becomes a thing. So James K. Polk, uh, Supreme Leader of Manifest Destiny. OK, so James K. Polk runs for the presidency in 1844 and he runs for the presidency on a manifest destiny platform. Now, it's very, very interesting when we think about like, you know, I looked at the Democratic platform and the Whig platform. OK, I looked at the Democratic platform and the Whig platform for 1844, the Democratic platform, uh, you know, they say we support the annexation of Texas. We support uh, the settlement of the Oregon question in our favor, 54-40 or five. They didn't quite keep that, but they promised that. And so the Democrats are taking on a popular issue that we want to expand. We want manifest destiny, whereas the Whigs were very quiet about uh, Texas annexation. Their platform never said we're against Texas annexation because that was something that the majority of the American people, uh, you know, wanted. So the Whigs often the Whigs were really the minority party of the antebellum period. And so this minority party of the antebellum period was not so big on democracy. Now, they had a brilliant Democratic kind of campaign in the eight, in 1840, Tippecanoe and Tyler, too, where basically that log cabin and hard cider campaign. 
the Whigs won that campaign because they put together a great campaign, you know, making the American public believe that William Henry Harrison was born in a log cabin, which he wasn't. Jackson was. Harrison wasn't. But Jackson was. You know, I mean, Harrison was a rough Indian fighter from Tippy Canoe. So they said Tippy Canoe and Tyler, too. They even had a jingle. So we want to note that the election of 1840 is a demonstration of popular campaigning, of parties campaigning for the presidency very, very intentionally. <laughs> so you see in 1844, you see that, uh, you see with that, that, you know, in 1844, what we're seeing is James K. Polk is winning the presidency because he is catering to the issues that people care about at that time and what the majority wants. We've got some recent followers on Marco Learning's Instagram account, Natalie Narona. Um, let's see, Ashai uh, 2021, drummer zero underscore zero star, Gabe Fritz one, two, three, underscore period, cat underscore in underscore the uh, underscore underscore hat underscore underscore. I am so glad I started my Instagram Instagram account. Instagram, that sounds what this is, right? An Instagram session. So, uh, you know, I'm glad I started my Instagram account back in 2011, where it's just like my name. Uh, those of you starting those later, that can be pretty tough. And so that is really like manifest destiny. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look at a political cartoon here. Now, those of you um, on the front row seats, make sure if y'all want me to shout out to your uh, class. Y'all go ahead and amend your question. Um, let me know who your teacher is, your class, whatever you want me to shout out to. Those of you who have, who have got front row seats, make sure when y'all ask me a question, let me know who you want me to shout out to. Same thing on Twitter. I'm going to take some questions from Twitter and let's see here. So now I only see questions from Twitter followers. Okay. So as far as that goes, uh, only I can only see questions from followers. Now, how would I contextualize the Gilded Age? Okay, by no, um, how would I contextualize the Gilded Age? Taking this uh, question from Twitter. And so the Gilded Age, the most natural, you know, you find the natural contextualization. The Gilded Age would be properly contextualized possibly by the Civil War. If you think about like the Gilded Age in some way starts during the Civil War, that, uh, you know, after the Southern states secede from the Union, Congress passes the Moral Tariff, M-O-R-R-I-L-L, -L, which which jacks up tariff rates. They then pass the Pacific Railroad Act, which authorizes the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, um, a massive internal improvement that is a cooperative effort between the government and business. So those are some things that are very important here in terms of contextualizing the Gilded Age. You could also go into the market revolution um, before, you know, the market revolutions kind of leading up to it. I think Henry Clay's American system is great. Henry Clay's American system, National Bank Internal Improvements Protective Tariff, um, the Southern Democrats were very much against it and the Democratic Party was the dominant party in the antebellum period. When the Republican Party became the dominant party, Henry Clay was already dead, but the Republican Party is implementing the American system, not a national bank, but the Transcontinental Railroad was a massive internal improvement project, a far cry from Jackson, like vetoing the Maysville Road Bill. And so when we see this, we see that, uh, you know, a protective tariff with the Moral Tariff and the Pacific Railroad Act, you start to see the implementation of the American system. So I think Henry Clay's American system is a great, is a great thing to contextualize the Gilded Age because the American system is really the position that the Republican dominated government takes during the Gilded Age. So I would say that the Civil War, the market revolution, Henry Clay's American system. Now, if it's the Civil War, make sure you think, you know, thinking in terms of those economic things that are passed by the government at that time. Okay. So let me show y'all. So I took a question there from Twitter and then, uh, yeah, so we've got now strikes. So some important strikes to note during the Gilded Age, the progressive era, um, the strikes in the Gilded Age, what we're thinking here is, uh, you know, we're thinking uh, the great railroad strike of, uh, 1877, the homestead, the homestead strike, the Haymarket Affair and the Pullman Strike. Now note that both the Great Railroad Strike 
um, and the Pullman strike were put down by federal troops and the federal government. Um, one of the big misunderstandings about the Gilded Age, a lot of people call the government laissez-faire during the uh, during the Gilded Age. OK, so as far as that goes, uh, you know, we think in terms of laissez-faire, but laissez-faire is one of those things that. Um, you know, that means that the government is staying out of things, okay? The government is staying out of things entirely. Now, people think because the government didn't regulate business um, during the Gilded Age, since there weren't regulations, then it was laissez-faire. But laissez-faire is not passing a high protective tariff. Laissez-faire is not a public-private partnership to build the Pacific Railroad. Laissez-faire is not the credit mobilier scandal, which basically involved uh, people grafting government money on railroad contracts. So the Gilded Age was not laissez-faire. It was that the government was, uh, you know, was basically... Uh, you know, was supporting uh, was supporting big business. And I'll show you when we look at the bosses of the Senate cartoon. So Betus, Savannah, Seth, Harley, the Royal We, Rebecca K, Haley, Frog with a couple dots over the O, uh, Bella, Alexis Peterson. Thank you all for the recent follows on Twitter. Uh, very, uh, very appreciative of those recent Twitter followers. And so with that, going on from there, Let's go ahead and you know what? I'm going to pull up that Bosses of the Senate cartoon and let's talk about using some visual sources. OK, so how to use visual sources on these exams. OK, so how to use visual sources. Let me see what I can do to find a, um, you know, a pretty good resolution image here. Let's see. So. Um, view image and new tab. Let's see what we've got here. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's go ahead and share my screen. All right, what's up, Zachary? And so we're still noting the question on, uh, you know, Manifest Destiny, Miss Kornfeld's class, please. Okay, so shout out to Miss Kornfeld's class. Um, thank you, Dean, for getting a front row seat. Okay, so with that, and information on front row seats is in the description of the video. Um, just five bucks to be able to come in, small group chat, asking a question, which benefits everybody because this makes for a more a more focused review. All right, so with that, let's uh, let's go into this and note the bosses of the Senate. So you've got here the Steel Beam Trust, the Copper Trust, the Nail Trust. Uh, you've got all of these trusts, the fat cats, these big old girthy uh, trusts that are coming into the Senate. This is a Senate of the monopolist, by the monopolist, for the monopolist. So here's the thing, the characterization of the Gilded Age, that's certainly not how people looked at the Gilded Age at that time. And you can start to see the public outcry against this, uh, you know, against this uh, you know, alliance between the government and big business with the government always tipping the scales in favor of big business, the government putting down strikes in favor of big business and not really listening to labor, the government passing the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was supposed to be antitrust legislation, and it was used more against labor unions than it was to make the market more competitive. And so we see here the people's entrance is closed. So when you use a visual source, make sure to make specific references, you know, that describe what's going on there. One thing that I often say is earn the right to cite, okay? Earn the right to cite. Um, because the thing is, if you have not made a specific reference to the document, you have not earned the right to cite. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, we've got here Abby Arnold, uh, MHS. Uh, shout out to the students at MHS. Thanks for the recent Instagram follow. Okay, Troy Less, uh, who's got on his uh, on his mask so he doesn't spread Corona all over the place. That's very responsible. And uh, let's see, if you don't finish your essay, Harley on Instagram, one thing to note here is that one of the one of the time saving strategies that I recommend, I say, do your contextualization at the end. OK, you, you do your contextualization at the end of your essay. OK, so I would not at the end, but go back and do it up top. So basically, my strategy is thesis statement. OK, so you want to do your thesis statement and then from there. So you think about. Write your thesis statement. Make sure it's very focused. Make sure that it's got a clear line of reasoning. Preferably, it previews two points, which is, is going to be in your two body paragraphs. So your thesis statement is very important. Then do your body paragraphs. If time allows, 
then go back and do your contextualization because that's just one point. So one of the things that I've got here, when you go to my A push DBQ page, be sure to show my DBQ video some love, by the way. And when we look at this annotation and setup guide by Marco Learning, it's prioritizing points, okay? For most people, I am recommending this eight point strategy, okay? This eight point strategy where you've got the thesis, describe two documents. Now, I recommend three. For eight points, would I recommend you use three documents because that way you can screw one up. I would not try to use all five of the documents unless you're not going to use outside evidence, okay? I think that it's very easy in this case to use outside evidence, do your POV plus, and I would say here that eight points is going to be a safe four. Eight points could be a five. Eight points could be a five. Uh, you know, that's something. I'm not going to guarantee that, but I would, I would almost guarantee a five for nine points, but not uh, for eight. But eight points is going to be at least a safe four. And I think that this eight point strategy where you're not now, if you back into complex understanding, then that's great. Complex understanding is one of those things. If you're still asking how to earn it, just write the best essay you can um, that I've never heard of a reader saying, I just read a brilliant essay and I didn't get it complex understanding. Um, so that's the thing, complex understanding. There are a lot of ways to get that point, but it's not based on just a word or phrase. It's a brilliant essay. So Julian Garza 02 on Instagram, hopefully will write a brilliant essay. All right. Oh, you, whoa, I'm going to follow this guy. Okay. Not bad. I mean, he's, uh, he's rocking. Julian's rocking on there. We got some metal going. Um, Okay, Julian, you're going to have to tell me like what you're jamming to. I'm going to follow you back. That's that's really, really great. I tell you, that's some like good like AP energy here. I'm going to, I tell you, I'm going to share that on my story. Uh, you know, we've got, uh, you know, let's see, sound on, okay? Oh, my. Oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's Slipknot. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Actually, that's, okay. That's from, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's Slipknot. I tell you, that is, uh, that is amazing. Um, you know, good job there. Okay. I love that album, by the way, that's actually my favorite Slipknot album. So, uh, that is, uh, that is great. Um, the great chapter, the great chapter that's from the great chapter. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that is a, that is a great one there, Julian. Thank you so much for that Instagram follow. Uh, I'm going to have to get some Slipknot. Well, I don't know. I probably don't need some Slipknot going once I'm done here. I probably need to sleep. Once y'all are taking the A push exam, I'm finally going to be done. Now, going back to manifest destiny, okay? So when we think about this, going back to manifest destiny, if we go to my effects of democracy DDQ, I tell you what, yeah, get, get the gray chapter going right before your exam. And that's, uh, that's really gonna, that's gonna get you somewhere. Um, that'll get some hype going. So, wow, Julian, that's, that's just some great guitar playing there. Keep it up. Okay, so, uh, so with that, document four, okay, so we see here, Texas coming in, 1844. So when we look at this, we want to, first of all, with a visual source, we want to note what's going on in the source. We want to specifically describe Texas is trying to come into the union in the form of a boat. James K. Polk, we can note here some context here. We can contextualize this talking about the election of 1844. Now, the difference between historical context for a document and outside evidence is what I would call social distancing, okay? The 1844 election is a little bit too close for outside evidence, but it can add historical context to a document. Outside evidence needs to be totally unrelated to the document, something that does not appear in the documents at all, and I recommend putting outside evidence at the end of a paragraph. But, or right after the topic sentence, but not in the middle of all the document stuff. So you see here that Texas is trying to come into the union. James K. Polk is welcoming them. Henry Clay and the Whig Party. Now, we, it doesn't say Whigs, but we can see the Whig Party trying to keep Texas out of the union. And Henry Clay realizes that, look, I'm about to lose the election over this because the issue of the day, Henry Clay tried to run for pres the presidency three times and just, uh, you know, always was just unfortunate to be on the wrong side of the issues. 1832, he's like, let's make this a re referendum on the bike. And Jackson beat him. And then we see in 1844, Polk is campaigning on Manifest Destiny. That is something that gets him into the White House. Now, as far as that goes, we can also look at the sample essay. That would probably be a good time to take a quick look at our sample essay. Now, the traffic is very high in there right now. So some of y'all maybe have actually, I may be, okay. So 
the traffic's very high in this Google document. I'm sorry if that's uh, if that's keeping some of y'all from accessing it, but you are free to take like a screenshot of this. Okay, you can take a screenshot, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be fine. Go ahead and take a screenshot, and that is okay. So what I've done here is I've got my setup guide. Now y'all are free to copy these setup guides, take the take the stuff out of there. You can either print out Marco Learning setup guide and use that if you want to annotate your documents with a pen, you know, with pen and paper, or you can use these annotate your document. What's going on in the document? I, so I don't have to look at it again. What argument could it support about the effects of democracy? And what could I use? I could add some historical context here. So with that, uh, then we're going to see here that in document four, James K. Polk welcomes Texas into the union. Uh, you know, we could say that manifest destiny was an effect of democracy. And so when we look at this, let's see where we're going to see document four. Now, my thesis here says the most important effect of the expansion of participatory government between 1816 and 1848 was the rise of the second two party system. Another effect was a more popular presidency and campaigns on issues that the people wanted. So this is going to be in the second body paragraph. Now, note here that I go into every sentence here. OK, so what we see here is, first of all, we've got a clear topic sentence. It should only take you about 750 words to write a full credit essay, a full credit essay. You know, 750 words is sufficient for that if you are efficient. OK, not wasting language. So we see here a topic sentence. Then. I'm going to say here, in this case, I'm doing my historical context before I cite the document, but usually I would do it after. But with historical context, sometimes it works better to give the historical context before. So if it's more natural to present your historical context before, then that's fine. But usually the reader is going to be expecting to find that afterwards. The first thing you need to do now, the argument here is that there's popular campaigning on issues that matter to the American people. A political cartoon shows people from Texas trying to get into the union and James K. Polk, the next president, welcoming them while Henry Clay and the Whigs tried to keep Texas out of the union by pulling on a rope and lost the election. So the first thing that you've got to do is actually describe the document, describe the document vividly as, as you can pick out details in the document. So you need to be thinking about this. You earn the right to cite. OK, you earn the right to cite by making a sorry about my mouse. I've got a problem with this mouse that I plan to replace soon, but earn the right to cite by making a specific reference to the document. Now, note here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm specifically referencing the document. It's clear what I'm talking about. I'm not just like document four says or document four is about manifest destiny. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm making a specific reference here. And so when we look here, we see the specific reference. And then here in the 1844 election, James K. Polk campaigned on manifest destiny, the belief that the majority of Americans had that the United States should expand all over the American continent. And so when we're looking at this, we're thinking in terms of contextualizing. So then I've got my description, the eight to and then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have my outside evidence. OK, now the outside evidence needs to be six feet apart, a good social distance away from the documents. Now, you know, so when we think about it in pandemic terms, OK, we want to think about social distancing. OK, so the 1840 campaign never comes up in the documents. And so with that, we want to note here that the uh, that the campaign that the campaign is something that is going to be a little bit uh, a little bit different there so we're going to be shouting out to some marco followers in just a minute there so with that william henry harrison running a log cabin and hard cider campaign now that never comes up in the uh you know that never comes up the log cabin and hard cider campaign never comes up in the documents so the 1840 campaign was similar with william henry harrison running a log cabin and hard cider campaign where he made it look like he was born in a log cabin like andrew jackson and he would be cool and drink alcohol with voters okay so that's something where you know i'm envisioning another document often now i usually say document eight but you can think of it as document six okay so 1840 presidential 
campaign. Okay, so presidential campaign. So we go here and let's see if we can find something here. William Henry Harrison. We should be able to find something from Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Um, let's see. So, okay, I don't see anything, anything here. Usually Wikipedia is a good source for visuals. Let's see, log cabin and hard cider campaign. All right, so looking at this, let's see what we can find there. So you're imagining this image, okay? So basically this is an image from the log cabin and hard cider campaign, okay? So when we think about this, the log cabin and hard cider campaign, um, which is you see Harrison standing outside of this log cabin. So basically I'm bringing this in as kind of a document six or a document seven, okay? I'm bringing in outside evidence. Now this is an, an approach. You, could, you don't have to use a document. I didn't reference a document here, but I'm thinking of this as I'm putting this in there, that I'm thinking of this visual image, um, the cartoon of King Andrew the first, okay? So when you think about this, this cartoon of King Andrew the first is something that we see here is that King Andrew the first is, uh, you know, sitting there with his veto. Now, when we think about this, visual sources also have a point of view. We know that this comes from a Whig point of view. The purpose of this cartoon is to portray Andrew Jackson as a tyrant. The whole name of the Whig party was taken from a party in England. So it's basically like Andrew Jackson is acting like a king. Now, if you asked Andrew Jackson, he would say that he was using the veto of the bank from his point of view. You know, I always think about, you know, the encounter between, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi and, you know, Anakin, you know, Skywalker, newly minted Darth Vader um, on Mustafar, where, you know, that, uh, you know, that Anakin says, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. OK, and that thing, you know, it's basically like, you know, that Jackson to people who support him, you know, Jackson is like, you know, the Jedi defending the Republic for democracy, uh, you know, that sort of thing here. And so, you know, with this, uh, you know, the veto power, Jackson would say he's using it in defense of the Constitution. But the Whig Party here, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. Um, so, uh, you know, the Constitution of the United States of America and uh, internal improvements. Now, Henry Clay doesn't think that Jackson, you know, is using the veto power correctly. But, you know, Jackson's like, you underestimate my power. All right. So with that, uh, I tell you what, I can I can go on and on uh, from the duel at Mustafar. But, uh, you know, with that, let's go ahead and think about these are how we can use visual sources in order to, uh, you know, in order to have, you know, something something good going on here. OK, so with that, uh, you know, getting into that, let me do a few uh, a few shout outs here. Um, see what we've got. We've got some new followers on Marco Learning's Instagram, Annie Russell, Meredith uh, Stam, and Zimmer Zizzle. That's a cool one. Zimmer Zizzle. Uh, Red Ace 10, Flower Patch, uh, Conchiwa, Rohan, Jay, um, Kylie Capola, Joshua. All right. So with that, uh, you know, we're getting that. Now, speaking of, remember, Marco Learning, um, on my DBQ page, we have a link to Marco Learning Study Guides. There's also a direct link um, in the video description. OK, so with that. And let's check and see how Romulus uh, A Push Review is doing at the App Store. Um, Romulus A Push Review is number four in education. It doesn't update in real time, but if you want a handy little trivia app that you can practice with right before the exam, um, that's a nice little handy thing to have with you. All right. So with that, uh, yeah. So uh, so exactly, Dean Jackson to Henry Clay. Your allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. All right. Um, so the French and Indian War. Now, I would not get so much like the call. OK, so the main call, Sarah, of the French and Indian War, we think about. Because this actually could be some relevant context. Sarah, you ask a good question here um, in terms of, of thinking about what could be some contextualization. OK, what could be some contextualization from periods one and two? Now, one thing that I want to note as well is we do have some beautiful study guides for Marco Learning um, that are available on, on my APUSH DBQ page. Also a direct link. You can go to Marco Learning, download that free full set of study guides. Now, you can also go to my blog on my website and I've created 
I've only done this for one period. I haven't done it for other periods, um, but you know, just take it or leave it. I've got a period three cheat sheet that's divided into, remember it's not cheating. As I said in a recent video, the college board says it's not cheating to look at notes. So what I've done here is we've got a cheat sheet for unit three if the prompt from unit three. Now note that even though the prompt won't go before 17, 1754, we have a number of things that we could use as contextualization. Mercantilism, the Navigation Acts, salutary neglect, the French and Indian War, and Hutchinson, if it's something to do with women or gender or society, Anne Hutchinson would be a great person to use here. Um, the Magna Carta, which gives us the idea of taxation by consent. So if it's about the Stamp Act, the Magna Carta set that principle of taxation by consent. The First Great Awakening, remember the Second Great Awakening could come up. The First Great, great Awakening may be something or the political ideas of the Enlightenment. Now, this is this first page is about the American Revolution. So just several things here, not a lot of text, just basically going into some things that you could use for contextualization or for, uh, for outside evidence. Then we've got the articles in the Constitution. So the contextualization there, I need to fix that. Uh, 1789, I need to fix that. But uh, the Stamp Act, the Intolerable Acts, Shays Rebellion, if it's about the Constitution, could be good at good contextualization, perhaps a thorough analysis of Shay's rebellion. So we're going into the articles, we're going into the Constitutional Convention, the articles versus the Constitution, federalism. Now, important for students to understand the difference between federalism and the Federalist Party. Federalism, powers are divided between central and state governments. That is a federal government as opposed to a unitary or national government. The Federalist Party, a political party that supported stronger central government. Okay, political party that, uh, you know, that supports stronger central government. Okay, so with that, uh, you know, that's something that when it comes down to it, the Federalist Party is not necessarily, um, you know, the Federalist Party is not necessarily a party that is the more federal party. They really want something closer to a national government. Now, Federalist, when we're talking about the, uh, you know, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. Now, the Federalist supported the ratification of the Constitution. Note that that's a little bit different than the Federalist Party, okay? So there's some continuity there, but not always. Remember that James Madison was one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, 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 and John Jay. James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. And remember, the point of the Federalist Papers was to promote the ratification of the Constitution. And so as far as that, promoting the ratification of the Constitution um, against the anti-Federalists who opposed ratification. Now, remember that our Constitution is uh, you know, our Constitution is the product of many compromises. As we noted here, we've got the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan, the Great Compromise, and then the Three-Fifths Compromise at the Constitutional Convention, which sometimes I call that the not-so-great compromise. And so then the final compromise was a Bill of Rights added to the Constitution, a compromise between Federalists and Anti-Federalists. So remember that the Bill of Rights was not part of the original Constitution that came out of Philadelphia. And so then finally, we've got 1789 to 1800. Okay, so the last one here is on the first two party system. So a nice little graphic organizer there. Um, if it's about foreign policy, a few things here about foreign policy, Washington's farewell address, and a bit about the Alien and Sedition Acts, Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. That is available on my website where just click on my blog. It's the most recent blog post, A Push period three cheat sheet for the 2020 exam. And again, remember, it's not cheating. The College Board does not define this as cheating. OK, so that's important. And of course, uh, you know, how's how's the app doing? Uh, you know, POV me, uh, you know, still number four, but we're working on it. Right. And so as far as that goes, and we think about the cause of the French and Indian War, that Brit the English colonists, British colonists are going across the Appalachian Mountains. They're British by now. OK, so because they've had the Act of Union. So the French and Indian War, largely about, you know, the westward expansion and then Britain and France. Now, France, remember that they claimed all this land, but they barely had any people on it. So, you know, the 
English and like nobody's there except Indians, but you know, we can always push them back. That's their perspective. And the French are like, look, this is our land. We've claimed this. And so the French and Indian War settles that. And of course, the French and Indian War results in the British getting, uh, you know, the new France all the way to the Mississippi and Canada. So the British emerge as the greatest colonial power in uh, in North America as a result of the French and Indian War. Now, also note that after the French and Indian War, that's what starts this, uh, you know, this long train of abuses and usurpations that Jefferson um, points, that uh, Jefferson mentions in the Declaration of Independence. Let me make sure all my tabs are closed, you know, unnecessary tabs are closed and all of that, uh, all of that good stuff. So with that, yet another resource, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and shout out to a few more uh, Instagram followers out there. Um, so looking at that, uh, let's see, Tom Ritchie's mouse. That's uh, that's interesting there. Um, thank you, uh, Al Alban Dog and Burnsy13 for the recent follows. Um, the underscore Ethan Lee. This is the Ethan Lee people, not just any Ethan Lee. All right. So as far as that goes, um, understand, remember, I've got the Marco Learning Timing Guide. Make sure you follow them as well. And, uh, you know, a lot of y'all, thank y'all for the 313 of y'all that have shared the Supreme Leader Gag. Okay, so the Supreme Leader Gag is on my Instagram. Okay, so with that, Anthony um, wants me to shout out to Miss Worley's classes, Students of Liberty and Worley's Cabinet, please. Okay, so Worley's Cabinet. Uh, you know, thank y'all for supporting th this live review. Thank y'all for supporting my work. And, uh, you know, I sure appreciate that. Best of luck to y'all today. What were some of the main differences between the first and second Great Awakening? So I've got this on my video about the first Great Awakening. I've got a little graphic organizer on that video that I'll put up. Um, it's really not, uh, it's it's kind of, I think it's, it's designed like I was designing stuff back in 2012. This is one of the first videos I put on my channel. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would say don't laugh, but if you want to laugh, that's fine. Okay, so when we think about this, the first Great Awakening and the second Great Awakening, we've got to think about what they have in common. So when we're comparing things, we want to think about similarities and differences. And remember, the first Great Awakening is one of those things that the first Great Awakening is before 17, it will maybe about, you know, it may actually be going on, you know, actually 1730s and 40s. So the first Great Awakening is a great example of something that is before 1754 that could be used as contextualization. So remember, first Great Awakening, Mercantilism, Navigation Acts, and Hutchinson. I've got all that at the top of the uh, period three cheat sheet that's available on my blog, on my website. And so that that is basically a collection of things that I think would make the best contextualization. Gosh, I keep looking at myself here with this silly haircut and I'm hoping the barbers really are um, opening next week. Uh, but you know what? That was worth it. Wasn't that worth it? Um, if you think it was worth it, uh, go ahead and like that post uh, where I've got uh, on Instagram. Go ahead and like that post uh, that I did last night with the haircut. Uh, if you think that Supreme Leader uh, review was worth the haircut. All right. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, going into, let's see. So the Great Awakenings compared. So they were both religious revivals. OK, they both had emotional fire and brimstone preaching. Now, Calvinist influence that basically human beings have inherent sinfulness. OK, they have inherent sinfulness and they don't really have a choice in terms of their salvation. Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Okay, Jonathan Edwards in sinners in the hands of an angry God is talking about how you are in God's hands. You know, this is a Calvinist kind of thing. You are hanging by a thread and it's all God. Okay, if we're going to compare these, you see where sinners in the hands of an angry God, God, wrath, nothing, hell, power, now, hand, gods. Okay. It doesn't show that you have a lot of agency or a lot of choice in the matter. You are in God's hands. Now, second great awakening. Um, he mentions God, of course. It's kind of hard to mention God, you know, do a sermon without mentioning God, right? So that's good. But this is a sermon on reprobation. So reprobate, reprobates, reprobated, wicked, damnation, salvation, hell. 
Um, so saved, okay, the whole idea of being saved. So you know that Charles G. Finney's, whereas sinners in the hands of an angry God is much more focused on God and his sovereignty that you are in God's hands. Charles G. Finney's second great awakening sermon, which Charles G. Finney would be somebody to note, he was a preacher in what was called the burned over district. And so he is preaching and saying like, look, this sermon is much more focused on you. Okay, the sermon is much more focused on you. Thank you, Tyler Hayden for the recent follow. And thank you, uh, let's see, um, Kiera, me, me, Kiera May, um, Kiera May is, uh, you know, is, uh, but thinks that the review last night was worth the haircut. Foshua commented, I like your cut, G. All right, well, thank you. Um, Luke Holloway with 311 in there. Um, interesting, wonder if he likes the band or if that's just random. Um, so thank y'all so much for the support. DAG 626, good luck today. So with that, Arminianism is not a word that you need to know. It has nothing to do with the country. It's named for Jacobus Arminius, who is basically sinfulness is a choice. Okay. So, you know, it's like I think Kanye said some time ago that slavery is a choice. Arminianism says sinfulness is a choice. Okay. So, sinfulness is a choice, which, uh, you know, that actually is a choice, according to Arminian theology, that basically you decide the kind of life you're going to live, you decide whether you're going to be sinful or not. Um, so we see going from there that you need to convert. Both of them focused on a conversion experience, but it's a different kind of conversion experience. First great awakening, God needs to come and make you convert. The second great awakening, you need to make a decision. So that's where you see the second great awakening as a causal influence of antebellum reform. Okay. So antebellum reform, when you look at that, uh, you know, we see that it's motivated, like certainly, you know, in the eyes of William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, owning slaves is a choice, you know, that it is a wicked thing that people need to uh, need to stop doing. So the abolitionist movement is very much motivated by the preaching of the second great awakening. Now, both of both the first and second great awakening you've got the spread of non-traditional evangelical denominations such as baptist and methodist um, at the expense of more established denominations like the anglican church uh the uh, sea bass i see what you did there uh sea bass all right so uh and thank you uh isabella carr um for uh saying that uh that it was worth it lamentations 358 i'll have to look that up sometime and so as far as that uh, annabelle pearson thank you for the recent uh the recent likes there okay so well thank you for the recent likes um best of luck to uh to all of you there out in uh, i guess uh north carolina all right so uh so great uh you know great there that y'all are taking that exam and thank y'all very much for your uh for your support okay so uh so with that we'll go ahead and uh and get into you know keep on with what we've got here but thank you for the recent likes there um annabelle and so from there we've got francis uh, muchnik thank you so much anti kelly the anti kelly and landon gucci so with that we want to note uh that now the, the first great awakening is not seen as like a major cause of the American Revolution, but some historians have noted how, you know, that is basically, you know, leading to this egalitarian mindset um, that is getting rid of hierarchies and leading to the American Revolution. Another thing about the great awakenings is note that they are uh, throughout the country. They're going on throughout the country. The first great awakening is also going on in Britain. So it is basically throughout the English speaking world. So thank you for that. That was a great question there, um, Anthony, um, getting into the great awakening. So uh, Logan Shay's rebellion and Jay's treaty. So Shay's rebellion was, uh, you know, a rebellion of Massachusetts farmers. OK, so a, a rebellion of Massachusetts farmers that, uh, you know, basically they're get their farms are getting foreclosed. This goes into the context of Shay's rebellion is the Articles of Confederation. Oh, what the cash says, execute order 1776. That's funny. I've never heard that before. Execute order 1776. And so so going from there, um, Shay's Rebellion, Articles of Confederation, the economy's not going so well. 
Okay, Articles of Confederation, the economy's not going so well. And so this is something you see, this rebellion of Western Massachusetts farmers. And one thing that we want to, uh, one thing that we want to note here, um, when we think about Shay's rebellion is it fits into this pattern of disgruntled white rebellions um, that you see going on from the colonial era. So you've got Bacon's rebellion, um, which is in 1676. And then you've got Shay's Rebellion during the um, Articles of you know, Confederation. And then finally, the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, which is um, the Whiskey Rebellions during Washington's administration against Hamilton's task on, tax on whiskey. Now, with that, we want to note here, and y'all are welcome to take a screenshot of this. Actually, let me see if I can find that. I might tweet it. OK, I might go in here and put it on my Twitter. Um, let me see what we've got here. Let me run into a push, see if I've got I can grab a screenshot of that. Um, so let's see. Let me go into early National America. The Jay Treaty. I'm going to talk about the Jay Treaty while I do that. The Jay Treaty was part of Washington's foreign policy. Washington's foreign policy uh, was influenced by uh, basically the neutrality proclamation. Remember that J the Jeffersonians, they liked the French. They thought that the United States should at least tacitly support the French Revolution. OK, they thought that they, you know, that they should uh, at least tacitly support the French Revolution, not necessarily to send troops, but to, uh, you know, to think in terms of, uh, you know, we should at least stand up for our sister republic, okay, France as a sister republic. And so that's what they're thinking. Now, Washington, not so much. Washington proclaims America, the United States to be neutral, okay, proclaims the United States to be neutral uh, during that uh, during that time. And so I'm tr still trying, I mean, I found it and then my, my thing crashed here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a, uh, you know, a nice little thing here that is going to, I think, be pretty helpful in, you know, just putting all of these things on one graphic together. OK, so putting all three of these uh, these frontier settlement rebellions, which I sometimes call maybe be an oversimplification, um, disgruntled white rebellions um, as opposed to slave rebellions. OK, so what we've got here, this uh, this frontier, the frontier settler rebellion here um, that we see here that I've got Bacon's rebellion, Shay's rebellion and the whiskey rebellion. And I'm going to put that out there. So the thing is, we want to think about the Jay Treaty was very unpopular in the United States because it gave Britain most favored nation status, okay? So it gave the British most favored nation status. Now, remember that we had just fought a war with the British, okay? So, uh, you know, Americans weren't very high on the British and it's like, you're giving that, uh, you know, most favored nation status. Okay, so uh, frontier settler rebellions and a push okay so that is now on twitter i have put out frontier settlers rebellion bacon's rebellion shay's rebellion and the whiskey rebellion okay so that is now out on twitter so john jay who was one of the authors of the federalist papers the one that everybody forgets uh john jay said who you know was the person who negotiated jay's treaty it was so unpopular he said that i could walk from one side of the country to the other by the light of my burning effigies by the light of my burning effigies. And so we see here that uh, you've got Jay's treaty, which was very unpopular um, at this time and kind of showed what the Jeffersonians believed was pro-British influence in the Washington administration. And that treaty passed the Senate by a vote of 20 to 10, like exactly how many votes it needed, um, almost like the impeachment of Andrew Johnson failed by just one vote. The Jay Treaty passed by just one vote in the Senate. So with that, uh, you know, we've got a shout out to Mr. Wasdell. OK, as far as that, uh, you know, Zachary, let's see if we can give me a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little bit more specific. I personally let me tell you about my numbered periods thing. You note know that, uh, you know, my so-called period three, uh, the period three cheat sheet, it's actually three sheets. OK, because when somebody might say period three, what I'm thinking about is, you know, I'm thinking about. Let's see here. Let me take this real quick. Hello. All right. So as far as that goes, let's let's see here. Um, so uh, so with that, OK, so with that. 
Okay. So with that, I just had a call coming in, just need, saw, didn't know if it's, it was an emergency or not. So sometimes it's an emergency. Could have been an A-push emergency. And so we are shouting out to Mr. Wasdell. But my thing is that when we're thinking about numbered periods, I like to think about instead, the numbered periods are totally arbitrary. Numbered periods will not show up on your exam. There will be no reference to unit four, period five, anything like that. I've always been a critic of the period numbering system. When I look at it, I think of the American Revolution, the Constitution, early national America with the first party system, the Jeffersonian Republic, the antebellum period, which you've got the age of Jackson, the crisis of the union, the civil war and reconstruction. So for me, I would go ahead and jettison any idea of like numbered periods, except to go to Marco Learning, download those beautiful study guides. But as far as that, Zachary, what I would do, if you want to look at the numbered periods, I would go to, uh, I would follow that link on the YouTube chat to Marco Learning and, uh, or just go to marcolearning.com, free materials, study guides. And you've got something that is just a beautiful way to study for all of these, uh, all of these periods. So with that, um, you know, we'll we'll just go ahead and go with that. But shout out to Mr. Wasdell's classes. All right. The social gospel and the gospel of wealth. Mr. Moreland's class. OK, Mr. Moreland's class. Thank you so much for your support today. And so with that, Mr. Moreland's class, we're shouting out there the gospel of wealth was, you know, Andrew Carnegie wrote this, uh, wrote this book, The Gospel of Wealth. And basically this is tied in with the idea of philanthropy, okay? Basically this is saying kind of like John D. Rockefeller said, God gave me my money. Now at first glance, somebody might read that as haughty, but John D. Rockefeller said, God gave me my money in terms of it's not mine, it's God's, okay? So I've got a, an obligation to give it back to God. Now, Andrew Carnegie was not uh, a very religious man. He was, uh, you know, a big fan of uh, Herbert Spencer, um, social Darwinism. Let's see here. Um, all right, excellent, excellent. So, so with that, uh, just to uh, just to note that Carnegie wasn't necessarily a religious man, but he's like, look, because here's one thing that when we're thinking about uh, when we're thinking about the the Gilded Age, we need to think in terms of do we call Rockefeller, Carnegie, Vanderbilt, Morgan. Do we call these people captains of industry or do we call them robber barons? Are these people who have created overall economic growth? Are we all better off because of John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie because Andrew Carnegie made the production of steel, the mass production of steel more efficient? Rockefeller made the price of oil. He brought it down and made a brand that you could trust, Standard Oil. It means it's the standard. It's not going to blow up. You know, imagine being afraid like when you're lighting your oil to, to light and heat your house. You know, is this going to blow up? Was it refined properly? If you bought standard oil, you knew that it was going to meet a certain standard, okay? That standard oil is going to meet a certain standard. And so I don't have to worry about that blowing up. And it's also something that is uh, that is cheap, okay? So as far as that goes, it's something that is, uh, that is cheap. Um, as well. So, you know, a good price. It's a good product. A lot of people liked Rockefeller before uh, Ida Tarbell got a hold of him. Uh, when you think about Ida Tarbell, who published the history of the Standard Oil Company, which was a muckraking piece. Um, after that, public opinion turns against Rockefeller. And that's where William Howard Taft goes after Standard Oil um, in an antitrust suit and breaks it up. Now, note that Teddy Roosevelt never went after Standard Oil. Teddy Roosevelt went after Northern Securities. Um, but remember that Teddy Roosevelt distinguished between good trust and bad trust. No, you never hear about in the Gilded Age a standard oil strike. Why not? Rockefeller tended to pay his employees above the going rate. So you've got the homestead strike at the Carnegie Steel Mill uh, where those people were not being paid well. But Rockefeller tended to pay his employees above the going rate, um, tended to, and, and he created uh, this efficient process for refining oil and doing it well. So it was good oil and it was cheap. So Teddy Roosevelt, in looking at Standard Oil, does this necessarily have, even though, you know, Ida Tarbell uh, made some good points about Rockefeller, some of his competitive practices. But in Teddy Roosevelt's eyes, you know, this isn't something worth going after because if a trust makes things better, 
better for the consumer, then that's, you know, then that's something that is okay. That's something that is desirable and preferable, like a natural monopoly. Now, robber barons, if we're thinking in terms of did they, instead of creating wealth and economic growth, did they take wealth from everyone else and hoard it? And that's where some people call them robber barons. So whether you're referring to them as the captains of industry or you are referring to them as so-called robber barons. OK, so with that, uh, you know, when we're thinking about that, we've got to, you know, we want to definitely think about uh, think about those things in terms of how we're judging history. Remember, your thesis statement is argumentative. It's not a true or false. Uh, you're making an argument. And when the DBQ puts something in front of you, they're not expecting just one set of arguments to be made. So if the DBQ is about the Civil War and the causes of the Civil War, when you take, uh, you know, the causes that are most frequently brought out there, uh, you know, slavery, states' rights, um, or economic differences between the North and the South. What are you going to choose as which one do you seems more credible with the evidence that you're able to put together? But we remember if we're going for a complex argument that we have to note that other arguments have credibility as well. So you would say that, uh, you know, that, you know, I, you know, if you think that you, your evidence indicates that the Civil War was about states' rights, but you recognize all of these conflicts over slavery. Complexity is not saying that, like, this point of view is wrong, this point of view is right. Right. Complexity is about saying that this is the point of view I find most credible. This is the cause that I find most evidence based and credible. Whereas this cause, while not quite as influential or credible, still has some credibility because of this, but not as much as what I'm finding here. So that's something that you want to that you want to consider as you're you know as you're going through uh, the dbq that you're making an argument so carnegie in the gospel of wealth is talking about uh what he's talking about here in the gospel of wealth is that this is the you know the gospel of wealth um, is basically philanthropy now note philanthropy is not charity okay when caroline was six years old we went to new orleans uh there were people who were begging on the street and you know i told caroline i said you know she was six and i told her look we are very fortunate to be out here vacationing we are very fortunate to have a little bit of extra money and, and that's the thing that those of y'all that have been you know watching the ads uh you know getting a front row seat participating in fireside chats buying the app thank y'all so much you know because you know i'm able to do things like you know take my daughter on a trip and stuff like that and uh you know i'm thankful for that and i'm thankful to be able to have uh you know some surplus income to go on vacation and so i told uh you know i told caroline that you know it's you know you think about it and if you want to spare a little bit, some change or a dollar for one of these people that's asking for money, uh, you know, it's just an expression. They whether they're going to use this to buy, you know, wasted on uh, drugs and alcohol, not my concern. If I'm giving charitably, okay. So if I'm giving to charity, I am wanting to alleviate the suffering of poor people. So if I can alleviate your suffering a little bit, that's charity. It's not philanthropy. Philanthropy is charity as an investment. Philanthropists, they looked at three things. Typically, philanthropy focuses on three things. Uh, we've got education, the arts, and public health. Bill Gates today is like the biggest philanthropist in the world today. And when you look at what Bill Gates is doing, Bill Gates invests in, uh, you know, technology in the classroom, which, of course, also kind of benefits, uh, you know, the company he founded. But that's another story. But he also um, does immunization. So education immunizations like you know basically and also you know bill gates is somebody who is an authority on public health uh, there's a netflix special that some people are like well why does he talk about this it's like bill gates is smart that guy's just a really smart guy and bill gates you know people are like why is bill gates uh you know commenting on the pandemic and i'm like you know what bill gates knows a lot more about the spread of diseases than you know a lot of people who are doctors okay this guy i mean just just take a look after the exam after your exams are over there's that three part netflix documentary about bill gates that was just mind blowing but bill gates invests very heavily into education and public health and so when you think about this education the arts and public health all right these three things so some of you have probably had the coronavirus already, whether you know it or not. None of you have had yellow fever. You know why you have why you don't have yellow fever? 
thank you, John D. Rockefeller. If you have never had yellow fever, go ahead and put in the chat, John D. Rockefeller. You know, John D. Rockefeller right now, if none of you've had yellow fever, and that is the case, uh, we've got a pog in the chat. And, uh, you know, that pog is John D. Rockefeller. Okay. So the thing is, thank you, John D. Rockefeller, if you've never had yellow fever. Shout out to my friend Bianca. Okay. I see the, uh, the YouTube chat's going fast, but I was able to, uh, you know, I was able to see uh, Bianca. So as far as that goes, shout out to Bianca. Bruh push. Are we having a bruh moment? So yeah, we've got a pog in the chat. It's John D. Rockefeller. Thank you, John D. Rockefeller, for your investment in, uh, you know, getting rid of yellow fever. Okay. That was very nice of him there. And so then we look at, you know, Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie Mellon University, education, Carnegie Hall, um, it, you know, a place where the arts can flourish. Carnegie Hall is a performance venue. So Carnegie wanted the arts to flourish. Carnegie built uh, like, you know, 2000 public libraries. So now, you know, yeah, libraries, because what happened is Carnegie as a boy, as a young immigrant child, he liked to read and Carnegie wanted to use his wealth in order to create a more equal society through philanthropy. So because of Carnegie, anybody, regardless of whether they can afford books or not, can now read, they can go and they can use the public library. So Carnegie felt like he had this, uh, this obligation that well, the gospel of wealth says that wealthy people have an obligation to invest in society. Vanderbilt University, the Commodores, some of y'all may be thinking about going over there. That was founded, uh, you know, by Cornelius Vanderbilt's family, and they call themselves the Commodores because Cornelius Vanderbilt was, uh, you know, was the Commodore. And so that now when you're thinking about the social gospel, this is an approach to Christianity that is really into social reform. OK, so whereas the gospel of wealth is something that is, you know, where you think about the. Uh, you know, the philanthropists, the, uh, you know, these captains of industry giving money to society. Uh, when we look at the social gospel, it's basically getting into trying to reform society um, in terms of trying to make economic reforms, uh, political reforms, things that are, you know, that the Christian religion is, uh, you know, is basically that a Christian has a, uh, you know, has an obligation to try to solve social problems. So the social gospel is a social justice movement. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, we will, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get it. So that's the social gospel. So two different things there that are coming out of the Gilded Age. Okay. Yeah. So Dean, you watched the men who built America. That was a great uh, series a few years back. So yeah, it's a great series. Okay. So, so with that, and I would ask uh, those of you with front row seats, let's go ahead and uh, sort of, uh, you know, we'll sort of call it a, you know, for right now, we can kind of uh, do a moratorium on new questions because I've got a few questions that I'm going to need to answer here. And so with that, uh, you know, now we could call Andrew Carnegie, the supreme leader of philanthropy. Okay. We could call Andrew Carnegie, the supreme leader of philanthropy. And so remember on Instagram, I've got, uh, you know, on my Instagram account, I've got here um, some things, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, basically how to write Supreme Leader on your 2020 A-Push DBQ. You can swipe there for examples. Okay. Timing guide for my friends at Marco Learning. I'll also be giving some more shout outs in a little bit, not just people who are following my account, but for people who are following, uh, you know, Marco Learning's account uh, as well. Okay. And uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's Mr. C's class. Uh, Mr. C, um, best of luck to Mr. C and his students. Okay. So I uh, definitely want Mr. C's class to do well. And this here is about how to write Supreme Leader on your DBQ. So you can call uh, Andrew Carnegie, the Supreme Leader of Philanthropy. Okay. So with that goes into how to use this, uh, this gag. And thank you for those of you who are sharing this with your friends. We've got like 393 shares there. Uh, so, you know, that would be fun, a fun way to entertain the readers, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, thinking about this. All right. So, uh, so with that,
we'll go ahead and uh, and get that going. And I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we also need to, th so then we've got, uh, let's see, Romulus A push review number four. They don't update it very often, but maybe we can get that to number one. Just a handy little trivia app, okay? Just a handy little trivia app. Nothing fancy or anything like that. Remember that on my blog, on my website, I've got a period three cheat sheet that you are welcome to download. I've just got it for period three, but if the prompt comes from there, um, could be helpful, okay? And then remember when you go to, uh, there's a link in the description to my A Push DDQ page where it's all kinds of stuff there, okay? Free A Push review guides for Marco Learning. They're beautiful, go check those out. New video on the DDQ. It wouldn't be a bad idea while you're waiting to start. I would recommend watching this video after you log into the College Board interface, I would recommend giving this video a watch while you are, uh, you know, while you are setting that up, I would recommend giving this video a watch. And so, so with that, you know, we see here the annotation and setup guide, a push DBQ rubric and all of that. Okay. So, so going from there, uh, there's all kind. you know, we see sample essays and sample DBQs as well okay so with that uh those are some things that are some resources that are available to you there okay so some resources available to you there and uh let me give a shout out to miss green's class at cvhs let's give a shout out to miss green students at cvhs she's wishing y'all good luck and uh if y'all are in miss green's class best of luck to y'all okay and uh moosh thick uh milan um, thanks for the recent follow, Christian to M, um, I underscore Shallon, um, and Kiki Fernandez, Ethan 921. Now, if y'all are watching on your computer, I would also, uh, Marco Learning is actually doing a stream right now. I think that John has Marco as a therapy, you know, Marco serving as a therapy dog uh, right now. So on the, yeah, so Marco is actually, Marco the dog is live on Marco Learning right now. So you might want to get a look at Marco. John's talking people through test anxiety, giving some stuff there. Okay, so from there, let's, uh, you know, let's go ahead and uh, and keep going here. All right. So with that, um, you know, let's uh, let's see. And let me see if John plans on coming here and, uh, you know, getting uh, getting in touch with us. Okay, so let's see. Um, you know, let me know if you. Okay, and let me just check, do one little question here. Y'all wash your hands or something like that. Um, let's see here. Um, how are? All right. So with there, let's uh, let's keep going here. All right. So Ariana, good to see you here, Ariana. And so with that, the transcendentalists. Okay. So the transcendentalists are an example of a utopian community. Um, the transcendentalists, uh, you, or actually, I'm thinking about Brook Farm, but Brook Farm was associated with transcendentalism. So a lot of transcendentalists, you know, went out to some of these utopian communities like Brook Farm. Transcendentalism is something that is, it focuses first on individualism. Okay. Individualism and this idea, like when you think about transcendentalism, that your individual, you know, your individuality even transcends the law. So, you know, now Henry David Thoreau was a noted transcendentalist. So he wrote a couple of books that are worth noting, Walden, where he went to a cabin at Walden Pond. And he went to a cabin at Walden Pond and he, uh, you know, basically just sat there by himself, spent time alone in solitude, spent time with his individual self okay so and he wrote about it i've never read it i reckon it's got to be a pretty boring book but who knows now he also wrote civil disobedience okay so martin luther king practiced civil disobedience but he didn't originate the idea henry david thoreau is basically saying look that if a law violates my conscience if there is a law that violates my conscience and it does not go along with my idea of justice then i can disobey that law in a nonviolent way. So if you think about transcendentalism having a an effect on people, think about like the fugitive slave law. So when we think about the fugitive slave law, the fugitive slave law is a you know is a law that is uh, requiring northern states to return states from the south according to the full faith 
and credit, uh, you know, credit clause. Okay, the full faith and credit clause. Um, Okay, so with that, the full faith and credit clause. Basically, the law requires somebody, I see a fugitive slave, I'm supposed to report that fugitive slave to the authorities. Now, my conscience says slavery is wrong. Slavery is evil. The Constitution may support slavery and the law may support slavery, but it is wrong. And so I don't have to violate my conscience in order to obey the law. Now, keep in mind, civil disobedience, you can get arrested for obeying the law, okay? Or, I mean, for disobeying the law. You can get arrested for disobeying the law, but civil disobedience, this idea that my individual conscience transcends unjust laws. And we also see that with Martin Luther King in his letter from Birmingham jail, okay? So, so with that, Henry David Thoreau is, uh, you know, with that. So, so going with that, uh, we're going into, okay. So, so that Miss uh, Bill Walks class in Maryland. Okay, so we've got a little transcendentalism. Could I go over the political and social norms that were prevalent in the Reconstruction era? Um, as far as that uh, as that goes. Um, okay, so a meal for someone. Yeah. So as far as that goes, uh, let's see. Um, all right. So, yeah, so that's the thing, Zachary, you're talking about like philanthropy. Now, even if somebody buys a meal for someone who's needy, that doesn't necessarily go into philanthropy. So let's note when we think about a soup kitchen, for example, giving money to a soup kitchen alleviates people's suffering. It helps the poor, but it does not invest in education, the arts or public health. So with that, keep in mind that philanthropy is not necessarily just getting, uh, you know, just getting into uh, getting into helping the needy, but making an investment in society. All right. So uh, so going on from there, the political and social norms that were prevalent in the Reconstruction era. Now, as far as Reconstruction, Zachary, um, that I am, uh, you know, the Reconstruction era. One thing that we want to note here is that yesterday. I did a, a stream on Reconstruction, okay? So you go to youtube.com, Tom Ritchie, and one of our live reviews yesterday was focusing on Reconstruction. So I'm going to, re I'm going to direct you there, but we'll note the difference between presidential Reconstruction and radical Reconstruction, okay? So yesterday you can see Reconstruction Review and 2020 DBQ. Now what I've got here is I've got some reconstruct. I've got a reconstruction DBQ set up and sample essay and reconstruction notes. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is we are going to put this into the chat. Um, so president. Oh wait, I could you know the questions are yeah. I wanted to note that the questions that have are actually you know what those of you in the front row continue to ask your questions and I'll just do the ones that were upvoted. Okay, I'll do the ones that are upvoted. So if somebody asks a new question, just keep in mind that if we bring in new questions, I might not get to them all, but yeah, y'all keep asking questions and I'll go based on the upvotes. How about that? So when we're thinking about that presidential reconstruction, radical reconstruction, so the social norms that were prevalent before the Civil War, the social norms that were prevalent before the Civil War, what we want to note here is that you've got slavery, and this social, you know, this racial social hierarchy. And so Lincoln, as part of presidential reconstruction, says that the Southern states to get back into the union need to submit a constitution that abolishes slavery. But Lincoln did not mandate uh, that this is, um, that there be a social revolution in the South, okay? He did not say that you need to abandon your uh, your racial hierarchy, okay? And of course, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, people from the North and the South uh, alike. Uh, you know, you've got people who were, you know, in these, you know, in all these areas, uh, you know, they had a lot of racist assumptions. This was a time of white supremacy. So for a lot of people, even in the North, they felt like, okay, if slavery is abolished and this, uh, you know, this racial social hierarchy continues, keep in mind that at the time, a lot of Northern states did not allow black people to vote or the full privileges of citizenship. So that's something that we want to, that we want to keep in mind 
as far as as far as that's concerned. Um, so presidential reconstruction is like, look, abolish slavery, come back into the union. It goes along with Abraham Lincoln's original goal of preserving the union. Um, so the, the radical Republicans, congressional or radical reconstruction, this is where they want equal rights for African-Americans, full suffrage, everything immediately. OK, so as far as uh, as far as that goes. Um, we'll, uh, you know, we'll get into uh, we'll get into that. So going from there, we are, uh, you know, we've gotten into that. So make sure if you want something on Reconstruction, I did a full stream on Reconstruction yesterday. The importance of 1898, the importance of 1898, Sarah, that is an important year in terms of, OK, and somebody's at, yeah, Dean's asking about. Uh, so we we've actually got a lot of you in the front row. What you seem to want to talk about is 1898 imperialism and the Spanish-American War. So let's talk about all these things. So 1898, very important marker year for U.S. imperialism. So U.S. imperialism, which is what we've got with 1898, um, is that you've got the annexation of Hawaii. Now, remember, one of the motivations for imperialism was naval bases. OK, so one of the one of the uh, motivations is to get naval bases. Pearl Harbor, we've got uh, we've got these naval bases um, in terms of, you know, that's, of course, you know, leading the World War Two. But we wanted that naval base. It is a uh, you know, it is a pretty good, uh, you know, it is a pretty good strategy. And so as far as that, uh, you know, you've got that. Then you've got the Spanish-American War. Now, the Spanish-American War, uh, you know, you've had basically the United States had its eye on Cuba for some time. Now, remember, the Monroe Doctrine said no new colonies. OK, the Monroe Doctrine said no new colonies. Um, you know, I think about George H.W. Bush in 1988. Read my lips. No new taxes. And so basically what you see is that the. Um, you know, what's what's going on here is that they um, are going to, uh, you know, oh, OK, yeah, Mr. C's class over there. Uh, so we've had our eye on Cuba, but Spain has had Cuba since before the Monroe Doctrine. So Spain is not, uh, you know, in by, you know, he's he, Spain is not uh, in, you know, violent like Cuba. Spain being in Cuba does not upset the Monroe Doctrine because Spain has been there ever since. But the United States still has its eye on it. So where this there's this revolution in Cuba or attempted revolution that the Cubans are fighting for their independence from Spain. Americans are like, hmm, you know, that uh, an independent Cuba would reduce Spanish influence in the Americas. And also we can move in on that. We can have American influence in Cuba. And so going from there, you know, you see that we can go from Spanish influence in Cuba to American influence. Now, the Teller Amendment, which uh, came out before the Spanish-American War, I always think about go to Cuba and tell her we don't want her. The Teller Amendment. Tell her we don't want her. But at least we don't want her officially. Now, what happens is when the Maine blows up in the Havana Harbor, what we have here is yellow journalism, an example of where you've got this, you know, this media hype, OK, that, that pops up. And it's like basically remember the Maine to hell with Spain um, that, uh, you know, the Maine blew up. The Spanish must have blown it up, OK, that it, it couldn't have been mechanical favor, failure. It must have been the Spanish blowing it up and they rile up the population that McKinley was trying to avoid war with Spain, but the population was calling for it. And it was just like, oh, my goodness, uh, you know, we've got, uh, you know, the Spanish-American War. And so so with that, uh, you know, the United States goes to war with Spain, very lopsided victory. As a result of the Spanish-American War, the United States gets the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico. Um, and the United States pays Spain some money. And so the United States, now Cuba is independent, but the United States gets this naval base at Guantanamo Bay, which we still have today. Today we put uh, suspected terrorists there so we don't have to bring them into the United States. Massive desalinization plan over there because the Cubans won't give Guantanamo Bay any water. The Cuban government won't. And so, so with that, we get this perpetual naval base at Guantanamo Bay. The United States just uh, interferes multiple times in Cuba. And that's one of the causes of the Cuban Revolution, which won't be on the exam. But resentment 
about, uh, you know, about U.S. interference in Cuba. So 1898 basically turns the United States into an imperial power, okay, turns the United States into an imperial power. And also that scene you see as a result of that, the anti-imperialist league, uh, which is, you know, we talked about that yesterday, um, that all of these atrocities being committed by American troops in the Philippines who are fighting against people who are just trying to have their own independent country. And, you know, that our government says, oh, they're not uh, civilized enough to have an independent country. Uh, so the Philippines, Guam and Puerto Rico. So after 1898, the United States has the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico and Hawaii because they annexed Hawaii in the same year. So with that, we've kind of addressed a little bit of U.S. imperialism. Keep in mind that, you know, U.S. imperialism, that was the DBQ topic two years ago. So I doubt that that's going to be the topic today. All right. So why did the U.S. want to trade in Asia? OK, so, Dean, uh, basically what's happening is remember that during the Gilded Age, you had these high tariff policies, which were uh, designed to insulate the American economy, according to the American system, build a self-sufficient economy, help America industrialize. In the early 20th, at the turn of the 20th century, the United States is industrialized and we've got all of these surplus products. So during the age of imperialism, industrialized countries like the United States, they're looking for new markets for for their manufactured goods. OK, so new markets for manufactured goods, new sources of raw materials. So. So from there, um, that's part of the reason why the United States wants to trade with Asia. Can I explain the market revolution? The market revolution is this uh, this period of commercialization and partial industrialization of the North coming after the War of 1812. OK, so coming after the War of 1812, uh, which, of course, uh, doesn't destroy the United States agrarian economy. The United States will have a chiefly agricultural economy all the way through the Civil War. But the War of 1812 does result. OK, the War of 1812 does result in a, uh, you know, does result in a, uh, you know, in basically the Henry Clay starts saying the American system, we need to have a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of manufacturing. OK, so we need to have a bit of, you know, manufacturing in our economy. OK, so we want to have a manufacturing economy um, in, you know, on top of that. So basically, we want to diversify our economy a little bit. And so. Going from that, the market revolution, we also think about steamships. Um, we can think about the cotton gin, these new inventions, and also the rise of like market capitalism. Basically, you know, this, this economy that's building, especially in the North, that is based increasingly on investment. Uh, a Supreme Court case to associate with this um, would be uh, Gibbons versus Ogden. Now, I have another thing. Let's see. A push review um, Tom Ritchie. If you Google a push review Tom Ritchie, um, then you can go into there is a page on my website. Google a push review Tom Ritchie. And I've got this isn't a new handout anymore. This page I haven't updated in a few years, but it's got an a push Supreme Court cases handout. And so this could be something that could be useful for you to look over. Um, this is from a review that Hip Hughes and I did several years ago. So that's something that could be helpful in terms of picking out a Supreme Court case as outside evidence. So that Google document, just Google a push review and a push review Tom Ritchie. And you will see that, uh, you know, a link to that Google document. So. Going from that, that's the uh, the the, revolu the the revolution. Okay, so as far as that, um, now I don't know, Zachary. I'd have to read that in context. Remember, at this point, okay, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, you're taking your exam in less than two hours, and so if you still don't know how to get the complexity point, don't try it, Anakin. I have the high ground. Okay. And with that, uh, you know, we're going to say kind of a last call because at a certain point I'm going to wrap up. Now, what I'm planning to do is I'm planning to do a short broadcast on Marco Learning's channel. So we're going to be wrapping this up in about the next 20 minutes or so, uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, maybe a little less. But I'm going to go to Marco Learning's YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com slash Marco Learning. OK, so you know what? Let's see uh, what we need to do here. All right.
Okay. So, uh, so we're going to go ahead and they're about to publicly announce this, um, that there will be at 1 PM, we will have something going on on Marco Learning's YouTube channel. Now, Marco Learning's got 4.28 subscribers. Uh, we've got about three, we've got almost 3000 people in here right now. Y'all can get Marco Learning. Let's together get them above 5,000 subscribers. Let's see if we can do it. 4.28, that's like all, that's like 780 subscribers. Let's see if the 3,000 of us can get Marco Learning above 5,000. Um, and then if, Mark, if Marco Learning gets to be above 5,000 subscribers, then I will be doing this broadcast at 1 o'clock p.m. We'll do a 30 minute broadcast there. So youtube.com slash Marco Learning. Okay, youtube.com slash Marco Learning. Marco provides, you know, these study guides that I've made available. If you're thankful for those, go ahead and give Marco Marco Learning, um, you know, some love, give them a subscription. All right. So we are, we are moving. We're at 4.3, ladies and gentlemen. So we've got less than 700 to go. Y'all are making this happen. I tell you what, we are a good group. Okay. So we've got, uh, you know, we are going to be there, it looks like. Okay. So I'm going to be wrapping up this broadcast at about 1240, 1245. Thank you, Kamabu, um, for this. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, let's see. So Marco Learning, we've got something that we're setting up and we're at 4.4. OK, so we're moving. We've got less than 600 to go. Let me keep answering questions. But if we can get above 5000, I will. When I wrap up this broadcast, I'm going to do another quick broadcast on Mar Marco Learning's channel, a 30 minute broadcast that'll get us ready. So do I think what we use already is outside info? OK, Ariana, when it comes to Googling or something like that. Um, I think about it like Lord of the Rings. A lot of y'all haven't set, seen Lord of the Rings, but I think about Googling as Lord of the Rings, like the ring is evil. You know, Frodo's trying to destroy the ring, but every once in a while, the ring of power helps you out, okay? So, you know, for, for example, okay? So if we think about something like this, okay? That Frodo sometimes has to put the ring on, but then he quickly takes it off. So if you're thinking about, huh, the first great awakening, um, who was, so who was, the most famous preacher of the first great awakening, okay? Jonathan Edwards, one word answer, take the ring off. Oh yeah, Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, got it. Now, if you need that, then do it. But if you don't need it, then don't do it, okay? So, you know, I would say that if it's a good topic, Ariane, if it's a good topic where you're like, I'm very confident in my ability to come up with outside evidence for this, and there will be gaps. For outside evidence, you're looking at gaps for obvious outside evidence. So, for example, on my, you know, democracy DBQ, I never mentioned Andrew Jackson. I put a gap in there. On my reconstruction DBQ, I never mentioned specifically the radical Republicans. I never mentioned by name a concept like the 13th Amendment was never mentioned. So you're looking for obvious gaps in the documents where you can bring in your outside evidence. Remember, social distancing, six feet away from the documents. OK, that's something that is going to be important there. OK, and so we've got, uh, you know, Elkie Zach. Uh, so, we, you know, who is uh, taking her exam. Best of luck to you and your, uh, you know, and that. So I'm not. Uh, yeah. So who's with me? K. Five, K5, okay, the climate activist and oboist, okay. Cl uh, K is saying that she's going to be writing Supreme Leader somewhere on her essay. So you think about Andrew Jackson, the Supreme Leader of the Democratic Party, right? And so when you're, when you're considering this, uh, you know, just like maybe you're considering, uh, oh, oops, let's see. So you're considering buying the, uh, you know, buying the app there. Um, so we've got, uh, you know, kind of a low year for apps because open book, open notes and all of that kind of stuff. So with that, uh, you know, looking at the, uh, you know, looking at that dollar ninety nine number four, we might get to number one, we might not. Okay, so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when we get into this, uh, let's see, we've got the A Push SCOTUS cases. Remember, I've got this web page, um, A Push Review. You can get this Supreme Court case handout, which might help you out a little bit. Okay, so as far as that goes, 
of a push SCOTUS cases. Remember, I'm on Instagram and remember the Supreme Leader gag that we might uh, want to think about there. Um, so the Supreme Leader gag, thank you to those of you who are sharing that with your friends. I think it'll just be a fun way to kind of make the exam fun. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Supreme Leader of Women's Suffrage, okay? And so, uh, you know, Ida B. Wells, Supreme Leader of Muckraking. John C. Calhoun, Supreme Leader of Nullification. Um, thank you all of you who have been giving support. So I'm just, I'm very thankful for all of that. Um, Queen of Nosebleeds is gone, okay? Queen of Nosebleeds is going to be putting Supreme Leader on her exam. Not something you have to do. People just ask me for a gag, and I thought that that would be, that would be a fun thing to do. Y'all ask me for a gag. I think that'll be fun. After all, I did shave the sides of my head, right? Okay, so 4.44. Let's see what we got now. 4.55. We've got only 450 left to go, which uh, out of so many people here, we can get 450 more subscribers. We got 2,700 of you right now. Uh, and uh, we can get that going. Okay, so 450 more subscribers, ladies and gentlemen, for Marco Learning. That way I don't have to go live on a channel with less than 5,000 subscribers, but I will guarantee a one o'clock stream if we can get there. So do you think it's better? So yeah, I would say, Ariana, if you can avoid, if you can outright avoid using, um, you know, using Google, using notes, if it's a good topic, you know what I do? I take my notes that I've stacked up, I would put them away. Like, I really would like, you know, one of the things, if it's a good topic, which what we've seen with, uh, you know, with AP Euro, all of the topics, Protestant Reformation, Enlightenment, Napoleon, French Revolution, those are the things that came up. AP Euro did very accessible topics. I think that what you're going to see, we saw the same thing with AP government. Now, I'll go on a rant if the college board tries something funny because I'm watching the college board. I'm watching you, college board. Uh, you know, even uh, I don't know if any of y'all seen that uh, that account on Twitter that it's AP underscore underscore Trevor. OK, so there's this account on Twitter that is AP underscore underscore Trevor. They haven't tweeted in a while. But it's uh, it's funny, like it's just basically a Trevor Packer um, parody on um, Twitter account, which uh, which I just I, I found funny. I wish they tweet a little bit more. OK, it looks like some of y'all are, uh, you know, liking the uh, let's see, using pages. OK, so as far as that goes, I'm not going to give a lot of advice on the technicalities. One thing, the only advice I'm going to give on the technicalities of the exam, I would recommend typing it in. I would recommend typing it in Word or Notes. I would not use Google Docs to type your essay because what if your internet goes out for a little bit, okay? What if your internet goes out for a little bit and then you are in a situation where your internet's out and you lost your, your work? So use a word processor that's native to your computer. Now, at 45 minutes, what I would recommend, uh, to the best of my knowledge, okay, that from what I'm hearing from people, that the best thing to do, now turn off Grammarly, all that kind of stuff, stay away from that because you don't want plugins working that could mess things up. But I think the easiest thing to do is go into Word or whatever word processor, type your essay at 45 minutes, paste it into the College Board interface, finish your sentence, make sure you did a full copy and paste that the whole essay is there, and submit it. Don't waste time. Don't wait till the last moment. Okay, please do not wait till the last moment to submit your exams. All right. So we are looking only for 380 more subscribers for Marco Learning. 4.62, ladies and gentlemen, um, so that uh, we can get them over 5,000. Show, show us what we can do. Show us what we can do. Um, so, uh, you know, follow your, uh, your supreme leader over to Marco Learning at uh, one o'clock. Thank you, new Twitter followers. Stefan Noodles, Jazzy is Tired, Rosie, Rossi Sierra, Becca, Vio, Kelly, Francine Diaz, Lauren, Aunt Mary, Will Pattinson, Steph, Abby Blank, Sophia Mara. Thank you, uh, Kelly um, and Angela and Justin, Gabe Fritz. And uh, thank y'all so much for the recent Twitter follows, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, remember, I put out a graphic organizer about frontier settler rebellions. Okay, so that's out there. All right. So the market revolution. Um, yeah. So I would say, Dean, that yes, the you know the War of 1812 and the market revolution. Now, the War of 1812 leads to nationalism. 
you know, after Jackson's victory at the Battle of New Orleans. Now, that's one of my, there's a song by Johnny Horton about the Battle of New Orleans that I like to play sometimes. And because we could use a little break, your brain's taking a lot in. Um, while y'all are, uh, you know, subscribing to Marco Learning, getting ready for that one o'clock stream, if we can hit 5,000 subscribers, okay, we only need 340 more subscribers to get Marco Learning to 5,000 subscribers in YouTube. So I'm going to sing this song kind of like a telethon. Um, we're going to get Marco Learning to 5,000. Dean's got his Tom Ritchie written test merch. Thank you so much uh, for that. So, uh, so what we've got here, uh, you know, I'll be checking on Marco Learning after the song. Let's see if when I check after the song, 330 of y'all have done there, you know, kind of like leaving me a coin or something like that as a tip, uh, which somebody, we've got $3 and 90 cents in super chats on YouTube. Thank you. All right. So this is about the battle of new Orleans in 1814. We took a little trip along the curtain. Oh, wait. Yeah. 1814. We took a little trip along with Colonel Jackson down the mighty Mississippi. We took a little bacon and we took a little beans and we fought the bloody British at the town of New Orleans. Fired our guns and the British kept it coming. Wasn't I as many as there was a while ago. Fired our guns and they began to run it down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Look down the river, we could see the British come, and there must have been a hundred of them beating on their drum. They met and set the steps so high, and they made their bugles ring, but we stood beside our cotton bales and didn't say a thing. Fired our guns, and the British kept it coming. Wasn't as many as there was a while ago. Fired once more, and they began to run in, down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Old Henry said we could take him by surprise if we didn't fire muskets till we looked him in the eye. Let's see, uh, they, okay. Now here's the thing, I don't have lyrics in front of me. I forgot, just for a moment, I could try to Google, but I'm gonna remember it, okay? So, you know, Old Hickory said we could take him by surprise if we, um, you know, if we didn't fire muskets till we looked him in the eyes. Kind of like the battle at Bunker Hill. Remember, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Here we go. So I know, okay, so yeah, so we, we held our fire till we seen their faces well. Then we opened up our squirrel guns and really gave up. Well, we fired our guns and the British kept it coming. Wasn't as many as there was a while ago. Fired once more and they began to run in down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. And they ran through the briars and they ran through the brambles and they ran through the bushes where a rabbit couldn't go. Ran so fast that the hounds couldn't catch them down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. Let's see how close we're getting here. Okay, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get there. Hopefully we'll get there. Um, 4.75, just need 250, ladies and gentlemen. Fired our guns and the British kept it coming. Wasn't as many as there was a while ago. Fired once more and they began to run in down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. And they ran through the briars and they ran through the brambles and they ran through the bushes where a rabbit couldn't go. Ran so fast that the hounds couldn't catch them down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> All right, my voice is gone. Okay, my voice is gone. That's what a week of constant streaming will do to you. If you liked that, uh, you know, get ready. Um, we're going to go live, assuming, you know, we've just got a few more subscribers there. Now, the Battle of New Orleans, you know, the War of 1812 ended well. Gosh, I tore up my voice for that, y'all. Thank y'all. But, but it was fun, right? So as far as that goes, the sacrifice of my voice, okay, that I have, uh, you know, I regret that I have but one voice to give uh, for, uh, you know, my, my students out here. So, so yeah, so basically, good thing is I'm not going to need my voice in another hour. OK, that I can rest my voice for a little bit. Um, but the Battle of New Orleans was one of three things that kind of happens at the end of the War of 1812, um, that the Battle of New Orleans was this lopsided victory. The other two things that are happening at this time um, are, you know, so the other two things that are happening at this time are the 
uh, you know, basically the Hartford Convention's meeting and the Treaty of Ghent's meeting. So the, the Treaty of Ghent's being settled. This is at the turn of like 1814, 1815. So the Hartford Convention meets. Remember that the New England Federalists, they never supported the embargo. Ow, this cursed old grab me. Y'all remember that cartoon? Uh, you know, embargo spelled backwards, get it? So ow, this cursed old grab me. And then... Uh, you know, we see that they didn't import, support the embargo. They didn't support the war. And so when we're looking at this, uh, you know, oh, this cursed oh, grab me. And so then New England is not really supporting the War of 1812 either. And so the Hartford Convention, basically the war had not been going very well at all. OK, so the War of 1812 had not been going very well at all. And, uh, you know, and there... Um, so going from there, um, the War of 1812 hadn't gone well. I mean, Washington was burnt. I mean, it was like the British came in and burned our capital. That's not good. But the Hartford Convention meets. They're like, look, we're going to propose amendments to the Constitution, which were totally reasonable. I've looked at the Hartford Convention amendments. I'm like, you know what? Two thirds of both houses of Congress to declare war. That sounds good to me. I don't think Congress should declare war by a narrow majority of both houses. I think that that's kind of irresponsible. And so going from uh, going from there, I think that's an irresponsible way to do things uh, when, if we think about it like that. So with that, what we want to uh, what we want to consider here um, is that, uh, you know, that the war wasn't going that well, that the Hartford Convention, they didn't have context. OK, so they went to Washington, D.C., and they're presenting these amendments. The problem with the Hartford Convention, though, is they didn't just propose an amendment or some amendments, but they said if Congress doesn't you know, act seriously on these amendments, then we'll meet again at Boston six months from now and we'll take whatever measures we have to. And so basically it's kind of code for secession that this meeting at Boston in six months could end up being a secession convention. OK, and that's what you're that's what you're seeing, what you're seeing there. And so with that, uh, with that, what you're seeing with the, you know, with the secession convention um, is something that is. Uh, you know, now they didn't have the convention, but basically once the Treaty of Ghent comes in, you know, they didn't realize what was going on there. It was Christmas Eve of 1814 and the treaty gets there. Jackson didn't know about the treaty either. And so Jackson gets a lopsided victory over the British at New Orleans and the British are unable to take the city. And that ends the War of 1812 on a really good note. And so we see this beginning of this nationalistic mindset after AP, after, AP, after the War of 1812. OK, so when we think about that, this very nationalistic mindset that we all want to work together on things. And part of that is, of course, you know, Henry Clay's American system. And so so going from that, we see this nationalistic mentality um, that comes from that. And so that's an important thing to note. And of course, also that during the War of 1812 and the embargo, uh, we see we see that uh, the North is start the Northeast is starting to embrace a manufacturing economy rather than just a commerce economy. Thank you so much, Robin Nemec 24 and Evan Hood 110, um, Abigail 0021 um, for the Instagram follows. Very nice of y'all to support me over there. And we'll do uh, we'll do some shout outs as well during the Marco broadcast, which it looks like we're getting very, very close. OK, the last minute review session is up. Uh, we are waiting, though. We are waiting for 210 people. We are waiting for 210 people because I'm about to sign off on here. I will go live when Marco hits, uh, you know, 5,000 subscribers. OK, so I will go live. This channel hits 5K subs. OK, so as far as that, I will go live when this channel hits 5K subs. So with that, yeah, so the market revolution, what we want to note here is although there's this wave of nationalism that you know we see after the War of 1812, it's only a short time later that we're in the midst of the nullification crisis because you know people wake up from that nationalism. They're like, whoa, like these Southern planners are like, the American system doesn't really help us that much. And so, yeah, I would say that when you look at the market revolution that's coming after the War of 1812, it is further differentiating the northern economy from the southern economy, which is doubling down on cash crop agriculture. So when we think, Dean, about salvation, remember that the first great awakening. Now, you can be saved in the first great awakening, but God saves you. That's inspired by Calvinism, that God elects you to be saved. Okay. God elects for you to be saved. 
And so with that, you know, whereas, you know, the point of view in, you know, the second great awakening is more that salvation is a personal choice. God wants everyone to be saved. OK, so, yeah, so so basically you need to convert yourself. OK, so, you know, the first great awakening, you need to be open to a conversion experience from God. The second great awakening, God is inviting everyone here to convert. And it's up to you whether you're going to have that conversion experience. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, a few test taking tips. Remember, go to my DBQ page, a push DBQ page. I would recommend taking a look after you sign on to the college board thing. I would recommend taking a look at uh, my new a push DBQ video that's available on my DBQ page. I would look over some of the sample essays. I've got everything on that a push DBQ page that you're going to need. OK, so I've got everything that you're going to need on that a push DBQ page where we've got study guides for Marco learning. If you're going to use those, I would print those out. Um, then, you know, note we've got the rubric that you're also welcome to print out Marco's uh, annotation and setup guide. OK, and of course, I've got those sample essays um, that are there as well. So that a push DBQ page, I think, is going to be a valuable resource for you. Now, of course, that is uh, that is POV me. And so that's something that, uh, you know, you can kind of uh, filter through on um, that point of view. So so with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, that's something that I think is, uh, you know, is worth uh, worth checking out. And let's see where we are I'm about to. Uh, I'm about to close out this stream. Thank you for all of you who have, uh, you know, who have bought a front row seat. Thank you to everybody who's here supporting my work. OK, so thank you for everybody's here. Dean, Ariana, you know, y'all were here at the fireside chat that we've had. I'm very appreciative of that. OK. And so uh, Anthony was here. Best of luck on the exam. Any last minute shout outs here in the front row? Um, let's make sure of that. And I will give a last round of Instagram shout outs. OK. From people who are new Instagram followers. OK. So let's do a little last call for Instagram followers. Gold Wings 101, Corbin Williams 18. I hate Sam. Oh, gosh, poor Sam. Um, so as far as that goes, um, Oh, that's funny. CEO. What if we use CEO instead of extra, for Supreme Leader? So Teddy Roosevelt, Supreme Leader of Imperialism there. Um, Shelly Gonzalez, uh, Ordaz A, The Michael Robbins, uh, Charlene, Riot Vodka, um, Kimberly Afeld, uh, Trey Boy 32, Megan uh, 16525. Some rumors say that me calling you out uh, before the exam may raise your score one point. So, uh, so good luck to y'all. Kaylee Elizabeth 421. Uh, if I shout out to anybody who makes a one, then you were on your you were on a trajectory to a zero before that. Um, all right, so uh, we've got here um, Dong Min Ru, um, LHS twenty two. It's me, Ann. Let's see, KT Wade, Elijah with a three, Elijah Gonzalez with threes, Mirror Mirror dot R Y, Colin Welk, um, Arunasaurus Rex. That's really funny, uh, Arunas Arunasaurus Rex. Arun, good luck. MTHS, the wrestling team, good luck to y'all on your wrestling matches and when y'all are about to wrestle with the AP exam. Okay, they push exam. Um, you know, let's see, Michaela Montaro, um, let's see, uh Mora Morataya Matt, um, 9243. That's a cool like a uh, water buffalo or what you got there. Kish and chips, Jed, um, let's see, Jed de Villiers, and we've got uh, you know, so thank you so much. Thank y'all so much for that. And OK, we've got a few more people want some shout outs. So we're basically shouting out now. Uh, I'm going to take a little break after this, assuming that remember Marco learning. We will go live at one o'clock or once they hit 5000 subscribers, whatever comes later. OK, so right now we need 140 more subscribers for Marco learning for me to go live. OK, so one o'clock or 5,000 subscribers, whichever comes later. So Isabel.so, Jasmine Castillo, um, Yas, let's see. So Yas is here. Let's see. Um, um, let's see. Yas, um, Adbelez is, and uh, Chad Long, P1P3 with all kinds of special characters. Um, Sarah Branson, Mary Towhill, Damon Singe. We've got Sophie Judd, Gabby um, Collegius is, uh, is here. Best of luck uh, on your exam uh, there, Gabby. And so, uh, so from there, um, which, uh, what flag is that? I got to figure out what flag is that, uh, you know, and a, and a G, I don't know if that's uh, for a, uh, for a gangster or something like that. Bella Cameron, Nicole Wang, basic AJ, Adrian, Adriana, let's see. Yeah. 
uh, Adriana Serino987, Candy Kane, Candy Kane. I, I get it. I get it. Um, but wait, Candy Kane or Candy Kanye? We've got a Candy Kanye there. I'm going to follow that one back. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So with that, and you're following Marco Learning because Marco Learning's following you. Charlene XO, Mira HW, um, GRXCEY. Um, it's not Jim, G Y M, Wu George, um, Corey Siegel. Um, let's see, Wheat Hansen, Sofa, Sofa Lope. Uh, then the real, oh, this isn't a fake one. Okay, so we've got the real um, library, Ariana. Okay, we got Ariana there and Hayden Simon with a, with a zero there. Um, Rachy Poo, PNG, GG Gwenny, um, Simbaline. Okay, so we got Simbaline. Chloe Jameson, Destiny Gaddy, Matthew Fenton, 1024, Caden Boholst. Uh, we've got uh, Mig Pat is here, Becca, um, Becca Barrel, um, and then uh, let's see, Christian Marshall X, Jazz Rice, trying to shout out to everybody with some good luck. Okay, so I know I'm just kind of going through shout, you know, through shout outs at this point. You know, keep in mind that we've got uh, a lot of great stuff on the A Push uh, DBQ page. So yeah, we're just kind of wrapping things up with shout outs. We only need 90 more followers on the Marco Learning YouTube channel to get things started. Um, Dil Dylan and just Dylan just Matthew Blue um, Blucifer. Lucifer. Okay. So Hannah, good luck. And also to the people at CHSW, um, all the students there. And uh, so, yeah, I think we're good. Matthew Boosie. All right. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope y'all do really well. Um, and that Su Susan, Bridgeham, and Zach Son and Crystal, 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 okay, I hope that y'all do. Let your life shine. Let your light shine. Okay. So we got from Honduras there. Excellent. Um, so Byron C. 54. Again, ladies and gentlemen, it has been such an honor and a pleasure um, to have uh, to have been able to guide y'all to yet another A push exam. This is really a privilege to be able to do what I do. And, you know, best of luck to all of you uh, as we go through. Remember the resources that are on my A push DBQ page, including those beautiful study guides from Marco Learning. And we've only got just 80 more people to get Marco Learning to 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. And so remember, 1 p.m. or 5,000 subscribers, whatever comes later. And uh, so just best of luck to everyone today. Remember to use your time wisely. Remember, don't go for 10 points unless you've done this in controlled conditions, okay? In controlled conditions, time conditions, controlled conditions, and you've done this already. Otherwise. Don't try it, Anakin. I have the high ground, you know, for democracy. Okay, so uh, that'd be, you know, we'll see if there's a democracy DBQ today. So with that, Ariana, Dean, Zachary. Uh, yeah, so glad. Okay, Mr. Will Walks class. Thank y'all so much. And again, ladies and gentlemen, it has been such an honor and a pleasure to be able to guide y'all. And I look forward to seeing a lot of you on uh, Marco Learning's uh, you know, channel for this last minute study session. If you're not gonna join us there, keep in mind all of the resources that we've got available on my A Push DBQ page, including some of my new videos on the rubric and uh, HIP POV. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, again, it has been a wonderful exam season. It is always a pleasure and best of luck today. And of course, keep me in mind, if you take AP European History, AP US Government, and Marco Learning will be there for, looks like 10 subjects now. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, for democracy! All right, Supreme Leader signing out.